Welcome to the IPX True North podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Welcome back, everyone, to another True North podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Anderson. And today's episode, we're really going to be focusing on cybersecurity and HIPAA compliance. And we have a friend of mine, a subject matter expert with us today, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself. And then we'll get kind of started. Mike, why don't you go ahead and give our listeners and our viewers a little introduction to who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Michael Levin, and I'm the CEO at the Center for Information Security Awareness. And basically, we provide different types of security awareness training. The interesting thing about my career is I started my law enforcement career in Silicon Valley in the 70s, before computers were even anything that most people even thought about way before cell phones and way before law enforcement had any idea how to investigate this kind of crime. And I spent about eight, seven, eight years as a police officer in Mountain View, California, and was a detective there. And then I got hired by the U.S. Secret Service in 1985 and worked in San Francisco and in the San Jose office. A lot of people don't know this, but the Secret Service besides protecting the president, has joint jurisdiction in cybercrime and credit card investigations with the FBI. So in the mid 80s, these laws were all being created. The federal laws were being created to deal with the growing, at that time it was credit card fraud or the use of modems and different devices to commit crimes. And then the Secret Service had to figure out how to investigate these crimes. And being a new agent, they said, you do it. So I spent a lot of time in the San Jose office investigating cyber crimes that were mainframes, usually mainframes at that time. And then I got promoted and transferred to Washington, D.C. and worked in the computer section in Washington, D.C., which was an interesting experience because we had everybody from some, you know, office manager or admin that was good with word processing. So send her to the computer section, you know, there was really no cyber crime. There was really no experts in this area. We were relying on public private partnerships with local experts that were in the industry to investigate this stuff. And then I had to do what all good secret service agents do and that's protection. So I worked in the white house for about six years during the Clinton administration. So, you know, traveling all over the world with the president and vice president and really just getting that, you know, protection thing out of the way, then got transferred to be the intelligence liaison officer at the CIA. So I worked at the CIA for two years which was a really great experience. And after that, I got transferred to Seattle and I worked at Microsoft in the Electronic Crimes Task Force for about five years. Back to headquarters in Washington, DC, managed the entire Secret Service Electronic Crimes Task Force program, then detailed over to Homeland Security as the deputy director at the National Cybersecurity Division. So I've watched computers go from nothing to where we are today with AI and seeing this amazing transformation in our lives as most Americans have, but I was actually involved in, you know, I tell people we were actually walking in the dark when we were investigating these crimes. We really didn't have a go by or anybody to help us. So we had to figure it all out. And so, you know, so much of what, I've done is self-taught, but my passion has always been, how do we educate the average citizen to figure out what phishing email they should click on, you know, or not click on, or what, what links okay to click on and what attachments okay to read. So we do e-learning and then we do in-person and webinar training. And the goal is really to help businesses and organizations to not be victimized or tricked by these hackers. And I actually had been, I've interviewed so many hackers over the years when I was doing cybercrime investigations. I was involved in computer forensics as well. And I really learned how they want to trick people and how they use their technology to, to use social engineering to trick people and to create an environment where people will make a mistake. And The sad thing is in the United States, most Americans 
have no education or training about cybercrime and cybersecurity, and they don't have any issues until they're victimized. And once they're victimized, now it's like, oh, why didn't you tell me not to things like that? So that's really what we try to do. And it's more of a passion for me to help businesses create a culture of cybersecurity within their organization. You know, and it's something I want to touch on because I think, you know, I'll speak for myself as an individual, not just a business owner. I believe, you know, because of the way technology is quite honestly rapidly involved over the last five years, let alone, you know, 20 years, 25 years when I, you know, the most advanced thing I had in my pocket was a pager, you know, and I don't know if most of the younger generation now even know what a pager is, but, you know, the reality is... The majority of, you know, I'll say on the U.S. based side, but I think it's a global thing as well. We have a computer in our hand or our pocket, and many individuals actually have a computer on their wrist now. And we don't look at it that way. We still look at it as a phone and we still look at it as a watch. But the reality is we have very complex and sophisticated computers on our person almost 24-7. And because of that, it's my opinion, and this is where I really want to kind of get your expertise on as just consumers, right? On, on this side of the house, we still are very reactionary when it comes to cybersecurity awareness, when it comes to information security awareness. And I truly believe, and, you know, coming into this podcast, I've done my own research and know now that I absolutely need to take some training, you know, because once you start kind of peeling back that proverbial onion, you do realize we're, we are surrounded our information is the majority of our information is controlled by something as easy that we could wear on our wrist now. So what's your take? And obviously it's a passion of yours. You've been doing this for a few years when it comes to true information security, what should you know your average Joe, so to speak, what kind of education do we need? What are things we need to be aware of to be more proactive? And that's where I want to get. That's where I hope, you know, this podcast drives some of our listeners and some of our organizations, you know, that we're partnering with. What do we need to do to get out of this reactionary kind of mindset as technology changes to be more proactive when it comes to cyber information and even HIPAA compliance? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting because when I talk about this quite a bit and the concept is that the average American, the average citizen has very little idea about how to respond, you know, when they turn on the computer. And I like to kind of use this analogy. And when I was in the Secret Service, you know, we ride in motorcades and you have this black, big black suburban that's an armored suburban that follows the president's limousine. They call that the beast, right? That's the famous vehicle. And sometimes we're driving in this motorcade and it could be a 10 minute, 15 minute motorcade. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. The agents in the back seats will, you know, start talking and shooting the breeze and you're looking out the window, you know, maybe you have 10, 15 minutes to just sit there and stare out the window and the guys start talking. And eventually the boss turns around and says, get your head in the game. And the idea here is that we don't get our head in the game when we turn on our computer or we go through emails every day. And quite honestly, I believe that for most people, opening up emails is the most dangerous thing they do every day. So if it's the most dangerous thing we're probably doing every day, doesn't it make sense that we need to slow down? And what's created over the years is muscle memory and opening up emails. I mean, we just have a tendency to get up in the morning, you have the same garbage emails every morning, you have a tendency to just delete them or mark them as read, hopefully, but not opening up every emails. If I can just get people to stop opening up 50% of their emails, I just reduce their risk. So the idea is, you know, we've got to start changing our past behavior, our past muscle memory and create that idea that when you turn on the computer in the morning, and when you look at your phone and email, you get your head in the game, you slow down, you take your time. And, you know, it's interesting, but we all have an understanding of the dark alleys for our physical security, right? So ever since you're a little kid, 
you're taught look both ways before you cross the street. You hear stories about people getting robbed. You know, you learn over movies. And if you are walking down a street, it's well lit. You feel pretty safe. You go down a side dark alley and you see some shady characters down the end. You you say to yourself, you get a gut feeling and you turn around and you get the heck out of there. And I always ask people, why do you get that gut feeling? And it's based on your life experience. Well, we have no cybersecurity, dark alley, gut feeling. And that's the thing that we have to do through training is create that gut feeling. So when you get this email that says, maybe it's from a, somebody on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, and it says, oh, guess who died? I think that you probably know them with a link. We recognize that's probably a scam. And if I really want to click on that, I'm really curious. Maybe we should call that person or text them instead of clicking on the link and just verify that they actually sent it. And that's the same with emails. When we have emails, these hackers are very sophisticated. They will get email lists from an organization and then they'll go to Gmail and Hotmail and Yahoo and get you know, accounts and names that you'll probably recognize. Trusted friend, it could be your boss, it could be somebody's picture you just liked on LinkedIn or on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. They're very sophisticated. They'll send you something that looks really legitimate from a name you recognize with a link or an attachment and try to get you to click on it. So in every case, we're telling organizations, we're telling people, you have to employ basically a two-factor authentication, which means you're going to pick up your phone and you're going to call that person or you're going to text them or you're going to email them and just verify before you start clicking on stuff. That's where we're at now. That's, you know, that's the nature of where we are with cybersecurity. Well, I'm happy to hear that because I feel like, you know, one, I'm going to start using your phrase to remind myself, but I actually just out of just absolute fear and no trust. I just don't open up an email unless I actually recognize the person. And, you know, unfortunately for a lot of organizations, you know, that we work with and or potential partners, they really have to go the extra effort to get a hold of me personally, which is you're going to call me. And it's something I've reminded, you know, our employees as well, because of these issues, don't get comfortable just sending emails, right? Especially if you're not getting a response, because if they're like me and they don't know that person or they're getting inundated with, you know, hundred emails a day, their first thing in the morning is go, you know what, unless I work with them or have a relationship with them, not opening it, not worth my time. I select them and I delete them. But the one thing I think that's also important for organizations to understand is this, because of these complex hackers and these cybersecurity and information security issues, if you are in a business where you need to be in contact with multiple people a day, perhaps part of your get your head in the game process is direct communication. Get back to the days when you actually picked up a phone and had a call. And I know some people say, oh, calling people's microaggression and this and that. I disagree. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. But the yeah. reality is you want to know the best way to get a hold of somebody for them to actually hear your voice. You know, they heard it. You left a message or they picked up the phone and they have a sense of security. So that's what I do almost just out of fear, not out of awareness, not out of education. It's the fear of, I don't want to open an email that brings in an unnecessary risk to my company just because the name looks familiar. So I'm on the opposite. If I don't know you, I don't open it. If you need to get a hold of me, if you have something, you know, that's important. My phone number is available. Call me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because you've probably heard of all the electronic fund transfer fraud that's going on out there. Business enterprise fraud is huge where, you know, businesses, wire money to vendors or wire money to contractor or somebody and they're wiring money. And in almost every case, when they wire money to the crooks, if they would have just picked up the phone and called the real person right. and verified that they're not sending it to some hackers offshore bank account number, because what happens is these hackers are smart. They get into the network 
They get into your email and they watch the way organizations do business. And once they see which manager sends an email to which finance employee and what they say in that email, then they can spoof that kind of thing, or they can just take out the correct account number and put in their account number. And in every case, if we picked up the phone and had policies that required that, and you call the boss and you say, did you really want me to wire this money? I never sent you anything. Okay, it's a scam. Or you call the person where the money's supposed to go independently, right? Not the phone number that's in the email that they right. sent you, but independently you call the, this is huge in mortgage fraud right now. So there's a ton of mortgage and refinance fraud where they get into the title company's email system and they do exactly that. They change information or they change the account number. But if you call that mortgage company or you call that person and you actually read off the account number to them to make sure that you're wiring it to the right account number, then generally you're going to be safe. So to your point, when we deal with emails or we deal with things like that is sometimes a simple phone call or a text to a trusted number can solve that problem for us. So we're not victimized. You know, I don't know if it's part of the culture we have nowadays, you know, it really started, I think the fill fast, you know, fix fast mentality, at least on the product side over a decade ago. And Michael, you know me, I'm, I'm kind of an operations guy, a process guy. That's what we do. That fail fast mentality is just always just burned me because it's gotten so many companies in trouble when it comes to quality. But I think it's the same mentality that you're touching on, which is if you fail fast in this world, right? If you don't take just an, the extra moment to make that secondary call to evaluate, you know, that link or that message, if you fail fast in this world, it could be more devastating than having a quality spill in a manufacturing environment. And I hope, you know, our listeners, and I want to talk about this. I know you're not going to say it, Michael, so I get to say it. And it's very clear you're passionate about this because it's all you've ever done. But for anyone, and I do want you to talk about a couple of things after this. Apologies. Let me keep my train of thought. I want you to talk about your, you know, ADA compliance, your relationship with the state of Colorado on that. I'd also like you to talk about some stuff you're doing with states like Texas. But for me, this is what I want our, you know, our audience to realize. You have no reason. And this is for me today as well. And I'm going to place this on my staff and I'm going to wait. I know you're working on some special things, Michael, and I don't, you could announce that if you choose to with kind of your vision on where you're headed with your education and the training environment. But I hope all of our listeners take the time to at least go on to Michael's site, his organization's site and take the training. And there's no excuse when it comes to time. And I will tell you right now, this guy and this organization has made the price point basically a couple cups of coffee. So you have no excuse for any of your individuals or your workforce or you as an individual just sitting at home. You have no excuse to just go take this, get some awareness, and maybe just like Michael's saying, you might get your head in the game or your focus might change or you might learn a few things. And, you know, again, I think it's important. So I wanted to say that because I know a lot of people, when you start talking about training and you start talking about services, this is our world. They go, oh, I don't have the time or how expensive is it? We're in the middle of our podcast right now. And I'm telling our audience to cut it out. You have no excuse. You have somebody right now that's created an organization based off of his entire career. And he's developed modules on that. And I think it's evolved over time as well, but Sorry, Michael, got a little long-winded there, how to preach. Sometimes I do that on these podcasts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I would like you to kind of dive into, you know, your training, the ADA compliancy, what you're doing with some of these, you know, state and, on, and maybe future federal levels. Sure. Yeah. The idea here is that our training explains the why for a lot of employees, they need to know the why, you know, there's a lot of our competitors that do snippet training and we're in this world now with social media where, you know, Oh, if it's a minute or longer, it's too long. I don't believe that you can teach people 
what links to not click on in a minute. I don't think that, you know, if you're sending out phishing testing and your employees click on, you know, they fall for the test and they, you give them like a 30 second snippet, don't do that. That doesn't explain to them the why and the importance that 100% of everything you're talking about is just as relevant to your home safety and security as it is to your work safety and security. Everything's interconnected. So we've tried to do training. It's And many people call it old school kind of e-learning training. But the concept is that it's entertaining. It's interesting. It explains the why, which no one ever talks about. And it really helps employees to buy into the program. I mean, whenever you have training that's mandatory, whether it's ethics training or any kind of training that's mandatory, the employees go in with a bad attitude. You know, they go in with the thing and I always say to them, you know, how many of you are happy to be here? And they all kind of look at each other and they go, no, it's freaking mandatory training. And I say to them, I mean, what could be worse than mandatory training? It's terrible. But I'm going to tell you one thing that could be worse than mandatory training, and that is being the employee in your organization that clicks on the phishing email that allows ransomware into your network, and now your computer system's locked down for three weeks, and you don't have access to email, and everybody knows that you're that employee. So we want you to not be that employee and we're going to try to teach you how you won't, how, what you need to do. So you're not that employee. Yeah. Otherwise so, we're going to put a poster up on the wall from here on out. And this is mandatory twice a year because of, you know, Joe Anderson decided to click on a phishing email. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of companies would never do that shaming, but believe me, the IT department and the management's going to know who clicked on the ransomware. Right. They're going to identify it. So, you know, the idea is that we can do a lot better of a job. You know, the employees, there's a lot of, you know, in cybersecurity and IT industries, they say, oh, the employees are the weakest link. And what we like to say is the employees are not the weakest link. They're just the biggest attack vector, right? The hackers know the employees, are, if they can fire gun, you know, fire off like all these emails to these employees, that some percentage are going to click on it. And so that's the whole idea of fishing. You know, they call it, you know, you throw the line in the water and you have the hook and the bait and you just throw it out there and you'd see how many people will jump on the hook. And then we have, you know, targeted attacks, spear phishing attacks that are on the rise where they go after the top people in the organization or the finance department or somebody that has access to intellectual property, you know, the competitors will come in and they'll try to get into the network by going into the accounts that have the most access to the intellectual property that they're trying to protect. So most organizations really have not figured out how to ensure that everybody's got their head in the game. And so I agree with you. I think ongoing training, and that's one of the things that we're moving towards. We're moving to a new portal that I'm really excited about where we're going to do basically a subscription service. And we're going to provide companies with a subscription with ongoing snippets and bits of training after they take the, have their employees take the full course. Then we're going to like, when there's a new announcement from the FBI, like, a couple months ago or a month ago, there was an announcement from the FBI that talked about the risk of plugging your phone into a free device that's going to charge it for you, like all the ones they have at the airport and how these hackers have got in to these devices and you plug your phone in, think you're getting your charge. And now all your information is now stored with the hacker. So the FBI had this big release about, you know, stop doing that. And we would want to do some training on that and try to remind employees of the risk. So I'm really excited about that. We're moving to a more video format, which is what everybody wants these days. And to talk about some of our, you know, 
the compliance stuff that we do that I think is so relevant. You're seeing more states like Texas has actually created rules for cybersecurity awareness training. And they basically have said they've created statute in the state of Texas. It says, if you do business with a state government agency, whether it's state, local, or, or even federal in Texas, and you could be a healthcare, it doesn't matter. If you provide any services to a government agency, your employees must take security awareness training every year. And they actually mandate what this training looks like. And we happen to be a certified provider in the state of Texas. They've audited our training. They make sure it meets the NIST standards. They ensure that we're doing it. We're making updates as needed. And then they say they put us on a list. And Texas and then state of Colorado has been using our training for several years now for all of their employees within the state. And then Alabama is another state that has used our training or is using our training as well. So the idea is that you're seeing more and more regulations. California is working on a big, you know, enact, they're enacting some cybersecurity training requirements that are coming through. And you're going to see more and more of that over time. That it's designed to help the business, but it's also requiring that they actually do something about it, right? So I tell this story, I worked for Microsoft for nine years, but after I retired, I worked for some other companies and certainly as an advisor, and we go in and we talk about security. And one day I had a manager call me up and he said, look, my people are supposed to be selling. They're not supposed to be taking your training. And so th that closed minded thought process is slowly but surely going away. People are starting to, organizations are really starting to understand the risk of not training their employees and not keeping them educated and not giving them the tools that they need to make smart decisions every day. Yeah, I'm seeing that as well. You know, for me, again, I'll probably pontificate on this one a little bit too long, but it's a passion of mine when it comes to education and training, because I'm kind of tired of the, you know, we don't have time to train, you know, the snippets are great. You know, those are, as far as I'm concerned, those are little marketing blurbs, you know, and, or those are bulletins, right? Like you said, after you've done those, the foundational modules, then you get these little additional bulletins, you know, things to be aware of things that are going on. Absolutely see the value in that, but for me, for those individuals and corporations that think they don't have time for training, you know, I think it's, there's this misconception unless they're perfect and great. That's fine. If you've got it locked down, you've got your head in the game and you feel like you can't make yourself better. If you feel like your organization couldn't be better at something, then great. The same for an individual, but I do believe there's a lot of value in these types of trainings and these types of messages, because, you know, myself included, I've learned a lot just from this podcast and it's changed my mindset a little bit. There's some things I'm going to do at our organization differently to make sure our heads are in the game on this topic. But for me, I always try to tell, you know, CEOs and their teams, you know, when it comes to training and costs and time, the reality is a training should force a behavior change in some way. And you're not going to get that behavior change from a one minute video. It's just not going to happen unless you watch that one minute video a hundred times a year or more. Right. And, right. but that's just one message. But for this type of foundational training, it's I always go back to, you know, building a house. You got to get the foundation right. And I feel like this is what you offer much like what we offer on the quality side through our training sector. But the reality is your workforce and whether it be federal, state, public, private, they need a foundational awareness of what's going on today. And that's going to change 30, 60, 90 days from now. And that's, Correct. that's the beauty of what your organization's providing. And, you know, again, I hope we could have a couple more of these conversations because this is an area I, I'd really like to start talking about cybersecurity and, and vehicles, right? And other appliances now. We've got all right. these things. We've got, you know, Bluetooth speakers with, you know, 90 different people that'll talk to us and listen to our conversations. And I think there's an awareness there too. But for me, Mike, it's, you know, I hope as we close this podcast, 
our audience realizes what you're providing is a foundational platform and an awareness platform. And I'm going to use your quote and quote you on it to get their heads in the game, to be more proactive, but to also keep their heads in the game. You know, if I'm an employee of an organization and every morning I realize, and you said it best, I'm liable, right? In some way, you know, I should take responsibility and I should take ownership of understanding that when I'm opening my work email, that's not my personal email. This is just as important on your personal life as well. But right. I should take the responsibility and feel that, you know, I am liable for what I do. And part of that is get my head in the game when I'm opening up emails, when I'm looking at text messages. Do I know that number? Do I know that person? Would that person actually send me a link? Would that person actually ask for a, you know, a withdrawal or a wire and make, do the extra diligence, you know, make the phone call, make that direct contact and safeguard the company that you work for. And that's a big one for me, Mike. And it seems silly, you know, here I am, but I want to make sure my head's in the game, you know, not out of fear, right? Not out of proactive fear, but understanding like there is, there are dedicated entities, dedicated organizations focused on improving their ways of hacking and getting information, just as there are dedicated entities trying to make that from happening and, and building great products. But there are, this isn't just one or two people. There are organizations that make their living, their lifestyle, support their lifestyle from hacking individuals. And so Mike, you know, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts on that and you know, we've got time to, to go on. I just want to say thank you for taking the time for this podcast. And I look forward to having a few others. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I have lots of thoughts, believe me, on all those topics. You know, PCI, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards and HIPAA compliance, and we're seeing more and more of that, requires that you train employees upon hiring annually. And a lot of organizations, if they take credit cards, for example, they're supposed to train all their employees every year. And then what happens is if they have a breach... They send in an auditor and one of the first questions they say is, did you train your employees? And when they say no, they're now at risk of the bank taking away their payment card processing to that bank. So then they have to become, they scramble to become compliant. And we're seeing that with HIPAA as well. You know, the hospital that's not doing training or not following procedures and ultimately Tell employees every time, whether it's PCI, HIPAA, would you just treat this information as you would want your information handled? Would you want a business throwing your credit card information in the dumpster? Right. You know, or would you want your, all your medical stuff on a thumb drive and it gets dropped on the cafeteria floor? You know, these are all things that organizations have to understand. And I, you know, I'm very passionate about this from the standpoint of, I believe there's three main reasons that every American needs to do a better job for cybersecurity. One, it doesn't matter the size of the business. It doesn't matter. There are thousands of hackers that work for government agencies that are coming after the United States. Personally, whether or not you realize it, your personal accounts are being attacked every day. You may think of it as spam. You may think of it as something that's innocuous, but it's really, they're attacking you. They're trying to figure out a way to get into your, your accounts. And I tell people, you don't need to know about Viagra. You don't need to know about, you know, the Nigerian prince that's sending you a million dollars. You just got to get away from that mindset. And then lastly, your business is being attacked every day. You've got competitors. You've got organized hackers that want to get into your personnel records and steal social security numbers and identity theft. And we do a whole section on identity theft and try to educate employees how to protect themselves from, you know, their information being on the dark web or what they should do. How do they react? We try to make it very comprehensive training and we try to buy into the concept of, I want to teach the employees what they're interested in. 
and give them the tools to protect their personal accounts and their home accounts. So, or, and their business accounts. So the idea is that, you know, this training has to be, as you indicated earlier, it has to evolve with the new threats that are occurring. I mean, think about AI. There's so much going on about AI right now, but crooks can use AI to craft a better phishing email to you and figure out ways to get you to click on that link. And they could say, we sent out a hundred of these emails and for some reason, no one clicked on the link. Make it better so people will click on this link. And now the AI is going to try to figure out, you know, what does it take to get somebody to click on a link or an attachment and help the hackers to craft better, more sophisticated emails, phishing emails that more employees would click on. So we've got to get ahead of that. We've got to get ahead of that through training and education and giving employees the tools so they have that gut feeling for that cybersecurity dark alley. Right. And once you get that gut feeling, you can then make smarter decisions. Yeah, for sure. And as I close this out, we always say in, you know, in, in my world, in our world, that these companies, they're always putting out reactionary fires, right? They're firefighting constantly. And that's exactly what you're describing, right? It's this, they should train, right? They're supposed right. to train. Right. Uh, they need to stop using those words. And it needs to be, we do train. And we continually audit and assess where we're at and our needs because that keeps you from starting your own fire. And in many cases, in the world you're discussing right now, you're starting your own fire. You're opening mm -hmm. up an email you shouldn't have opened, right? You're opening up a text that you shouldn't have opened. You're clicking on a link that you know the odds are somebody that you know didn't send to you, but you're doing it anyway because your head's not in the game. So now you've got a fire. Now you got to put yeah. it out, you know, yeah. and that fire for an organization could be huge and on an individual as well. I know individuals that have been impacted by this and lost a lot of money and never got it back because their head wasn't in the game and they clicked on one link and then they answered that and then they sent information that they shouldn't have. And then three small steps, you know, they lost five or six figures that they never got back, you yeah. know, again, Mike, Thank you for joining us on this True North podcast. We're going to have a couple more of these. I look forward to diving Great. into the realm of, you know, all things cybersecurity and information security. It's just been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to seeing what you're getting ready to deploy. I know you're working on some fun stuff and evolving, you know, how you're reaching your audience as well. But again, Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. I really enjoyed our conversation. Look forward to talking again in the future. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.